Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I jump in in my Sparkfile. Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, your one-stop bento box for creative inspiration. <laughs> I'm Laura Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're an OG listener, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Woo-hoo! You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are good questions and we have got answers. Yes, we do. A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations and all of your fascinations. Here's the deal. We are makers who make all kinds of things. If you're anything like us and you're making stuff all the time or you want to be making stuff all the time, you know the wellspring of inspiration can run a little dry. So we're on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity. Things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast. Or a deliberate limitation that might liberate your creativity. Mm, Mm -hmm. or a wonderful way to navigate the day. Ooh, every episode we're going to reach into our spark files and exchange some sparks. And from time to time, we're going to talk to some folks who spark us too. And if you're not careful, you might just rise up in the morning singing a happy tune. So without further ado, let's open up the The spark Spark file. file. Oh, Susan, I'm so curious about your spark. I'm really excited. Manage your expectations. (laughs) You know, we'll see. We'll see how it holds up under scrutiny. I don't know. Um, Do you have a spark? I have a spark. Do you want to share? I do. Do you want me to go first? I will. I will. (laughs) I'm I'm gonna. I'm gonna do it soon. Do you want me to go first? I will. I will. I'm gonna do it. Um, Suze, have you ever heard of the novel Avoid by Georges Perec? I don't know any of those words in that sentence. Not except one the word. word. Have you heard of a novel? Have I don't know the rest of, the of novel? that. Have you heard of the novel Avoid no. by Georges Perec? I'm so, I'm glad. I'm glad because I want to tell you a few things. Um, I think many, you know, some people may have, but so this week, I was in, um, admittedly, the very lucky and privileged position of reading through job applications and cover letters for a position that I'm hiring. And one of the cover letters, I want to sidebar, like I would like to credit them, but I also need to keep it (laughs) confidential. So I'm not going to quote the letter exactly or call anyone out. Um, But all bosses out there, beware, people are looking for jobs. Um, (laughs) <laughs> so one of the cover letters was making a point about how challenges and limitations can produce the most creativity. And they cited the book Avoid by Georges Perec. If you're unfamiliar. And I am. And you are. So this is good. 
Avoid is a novel. It's 300 pages long, and the writer, Georges Perec, does not allow himself to use the letter E <gasps> anywhere. Not once, Suze. Not what? once. Well, it appears on the title page in his, oh. because it's in his own name, but otherwise, oh. none. You are kidding me. I am not kidding. 300 fucking pages. And Wait a what? second. Yeah. Camion, just yeah, as is. when you said yeah. that, I started just eyeballing the text that makes up my spark. <laughs> Every single <laughs> sentence has ease in it. Yeah, it's Every like single one. Every one because it's the either the most used letter or like the second most used letter. It's, Jeez yeah. Louise. it's definitely the most used vowel. So what is so astounding is that by restricting his text, he creates an arguably more vivid, more expansive use of language. What's missing is responsible for all that exists. Wow. Yeah, let that blow your this mind. Is, for a this minute. is this is this is um right off the bat. Right off really the bat, strong. Says, I am not strong holding. spark work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you this so much. This pandemic's not keeping your sparks down. Really good <laughs> you form are on today. point. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Okay. Really well, good. if that blew your mind, I'm going to add another layer. Okay. So, in fairness to my past teachers, once I dug into this, I was a little bit like, oh, maybe I did learn about this somewhere in the catalog of my mind. Like, it was like a line of text somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like it mm -hmm. was buried in there maybe, but mm -hmm. I can't say that I gave it a ton of thought or really mm -hmm. understood the con. But I feel like, okay, teachers, I don't want to say you didn't teach me <laughs> anything, but there was, you know, it's in there. It didn't make a strong impression. It did not make if, a strong if impression. If you received it, it did not make a strong impression. That's okay. right. That's right. So, but now looking a little bit deeper and with more consideration, I dug into it and I learned that the novel was written in French, but it has been translated to many, <gasps> many languages. And that's right. If you're thinking what, what I think you're thinking, the no. translators challenge themselves to not Ugh. use any words with E in them either. So and if it was in a language where it wasn't like, like, for instance, if it was written in Chinese characters... Did they restrict themselves? You know, I don't know about Chinese. I know that in most of the languages that are similar, you that know. That have um, like the alphabet. Got it, got yes. it, got it. Um, they didn't use E's. I think in Spanish, they did not use the letter A because that oh, is the most frequently used. Yes. Vowel. So they tried to, you know, basically convert the construct and stay true Unbelievable. to it. Unbelievable. What is incredible is like many of the translators won awards for their translate, like <gasps> the Oscars of translation for are sure. Are they called the tr transies? What are the translation They're not Oscars called the for? transies. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, you know what? I meant to go back and look that up, but they're fancy, fancy awards for translators <laughs> and they <laughs> won them for this translation. I mean, it's so incredible because you're, already like limited, like just, just translating in general, yeah. you're limited yeah. to like, okay, that word could mean, I don't know, maybe five words. I got to find the right word. And if you're like, this is the right word, but this has an E in it. then I got to really work around this. Back that thing up and give it another spin. That's crazy. So, so this is totally crazy, but I want to read to you the first paragraph of this novel avoid. And this is translated from French to English, and there's still not a single E in this paragraph. Okay. Are you okay. ready? Okay. I'm, I'm ready, and I'm focused, and I, I was hoping you would do this. Here okay. we go. Okay. All right. I got to take a deep breath. All right. <clears throat> Today, by radio, and also on Giant Hoardings, a rabbi, an admiral notorious for his links to masonry, a trio of cardinals, a trio, too, of insignificant politicians bought and paid for by a rich and corrupt Anglo-Canadian banking corporation, inform us all of how our country now risks dying of starvation. A rumor. That's my initial thought as I switch off my radio. A rumor or possibly a hoax. Propaganda, 
I murmur anxiously, as though just by saying so, I might allay my doubts. Typical politician's propaganda, but public opinion gradually absorbs it as a fact. Oh my God. Camion, when you're looking at that on the page, if someone just slid it in front of your eyeballs nope. and said, what do you think's interesting about this? Nope, I wouldn't get it. And even if you said there's not an E in here, I'd be like, that's not true. Let uh, Hang on. Let me just look at it. I'm going to find an E. There has to be wow. an E in here. Because it's a, it's a hefty chunk of text. And you just can't believe. You're like, wait, there's not an E in that. No, there's not an E in. No, no, there's not an E. Nowhere. It's incredible. It does sound, though, I have to say there is something distinct about the language. It it does sound like... It sounds heightened a bit, right? It sounds translated um, because it's sort of like they're using words that wouldn't be your first choicey words. That's right. Oh, I'm going to get to that. I'm totally yeah. going to get to that because that is exactly... Yeah. That is the truth. Like, if you think about the things that you can't say with an E, yeah. like you can never use the word the, they, them. Yeah. You can't say me, be, or been, see, or seen. There are just some really basic, what you call penny words, yeah. as you would say, that are yeah. out of the question. And I think that it forces your brain to go to the next. So if your brain might easily and quickly land on this word, and now it's got to go to the next, to what second, else means third, or fourth that. choice. That's yes, right. Yes. That's right. Oh, fascinating. God, this it's is amazing. so interesting. So I think that this, um, you know, I don't know that the story itself won a lot of awards. I think the story is about a man that goes missing and his friends, like, use his diary to find him. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but, of course, uh, what has stuck with people is the lack of the use of the, the letter e. limitation the limitation, the limitation huh. around the self-expression so yes. this got me thinking i mean first of all way to write a cover letter that gets a person thinking beyond a cover letter like kudos to that yeah, mental note for to all that. Job also did the, did the cover letter include the letter e <laughs> I, I think it did, okay. but you know, they were making a different point, but yeah, it, the cover letter definitely included the letter E. Okay. But as I was researching, like there were a lot of reviews of the book that attempted to not use the letter E like really cleverly and, um, some more successful than others, but <laughs> I bet, but second of all, this got me thinking about just how many restrictions it feels like we have on ourselves right now. Oh, so yeah. Many limitations. Like we can't go out and we can't see, you know, we can't see people. And you and I are making this podcast and we can't look at each other in the eyeballs. I can't look at your pretty face. We can't have an audience. We can't get live reactions from anyone. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe maybe if you're a different form of artist, you can't get the materials you need. You can't go to the store. Or maybe you could go to the store, but you can't spend any money right now because you need to be saving it. Like there's just a whole yeah. lot of things that feel really limited. limiting. Limiting? Limiting. Limiting. Mm -hmm. Limiting. Thanks. We'll fix that in post. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say the sentence again? You don't have to. Okay. We can always leave it. We can leave it in when it when you say laugh and say we'll fix that in post. That solves it. That's it right there. It does. You know, I'll say it again just in case for any reason. And it can feel really limiting. Wait. But I don't care if you do. Wait. Fix it or Wait. not. Mm -hmm. Wait. You know what would be an interesting uh, limiting what? creative experiment? What? To try to record a whole podcast and not, and with an eye towards not editing <gasps> anything. I know editing. Oh my gosh. Yes. Should this be the one or should we put that on another one and say, we're going to use creative limitation? Do you want to try? We can do it. We can be this one. Or are we deciding right in the middle of this one? And this is when the listener will find out as well as when we're finding out that <laughs> we've decided to use the device creative limitation. Okay, how about from this point forward? Okay, from this point forward, we're not editing. Okay. Oh my gosh, I'm excited. Okay. I'm terrified, but okay. First of all, 
I'll try to calm myself because you won't be able to edit out like any like really loud sounds. So calm yourself, Laura. All right, here we go. So there is a name, as you may have guessed already, there's a name for intentionally restricting yourself called creative limitation. And hmm. it's used in so many ways by so many artists. And I have never me, heard of this called a thing before. This is really? so fast. No, this is I fascinating. Love I love that you haven't heard of it. I Freshness. think that, you know, the concept um, has been around for a long, long time and in many different forms, but the name and, and recently like it had another moment in popular culture in like 2013, I think, the annual TED conference had sort of a loose theme related to this idea. Hmm. And they had a breakout speaker that garnered a lot of attention. And his name is Phil Hansen. He's an artist. And you need to watch his TED talk, just hands down, full stop. I'll say that right off the bat. Hmm. But For those of you who can't watch it right in this moment, I will tell you a little bit about his TED Talk. Phil was an artist that was focused on pointillism, which is the, you know, art Mm -hmm. with um, little dots, little tiny dots. Yeah. Like what George Surratt did. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little dots that come together to create a bigger uh, image. And he had been doing it for years and he was in college uh, studying art and he developed a shake in his hand that didn't allow him to create clear, distinct yes. thoughts anymore. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yes. He couldn't even write a straight line. It turned out he had permanent nerve damage in the hand that he used to make those dots. <gasps> um, yeah. And it was devastating to him. He left art school. He just like abandoned art completely. He was so crushed by this. Yeah. And he tried to move on for like three years or so. He just avoided it, but art kept calling him back. So he eventually went to a neurologist who said, you know, essentially there's nothing you can do about that nerve damage, but why don't you just embrace the shake? See what you could create working with it instead of working against it. Wow. So one of the things he realized right off the bat was that if he worked in a bigger scale, he could still enjoy what he was passionate about, the pointillism, which is really about fragmenting images, you know, having small dots or lines come together to create a unified whole. Um, And he found other ways to do it. He like dipped his feet in paint and walked on canvases to make different shapes with his feet. He used like um, karate chops like uh, applying paint only to like the edge. If you could like make a karate chop with your hand and and like your pinky finger through wrist, if he dipped that in paint and um, he created a, 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 this incredible mural out of just like karate chops. Wow. Um, really, really amazing. And so he found, of course, that he could make art and art that is incredible. We'll post all of this, but... He started to look for limitations to inspire his creativity. Amazing. Like, yeah. Like it because was, his art was evolving. It was sort of like this, uh, what we call when we talk about such things, this flaming curveball came at him mm-hmm. and his adaptation to it. He wasn't just like, well, I guess that's the end of my career in the arts. He, I think he had uh, a few of those days. I'm then, sure. Yeah, don't we all? Yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. then he adapted. To that's right. The limitation and his art evolved because of it. That's right. It's amazing. It's incredible. He's so inspiring. Um, he then would create limitations and constructs to work within that would only bolster his creativity. Like mm. he would, he would um, say, "What if I could only create with one dollar's worth of supplies?" Or oh. "What if I had to rely on others for the content of my art?" He created this piece where. It was um, like a huge canvas on uh, like a wheel that would allow it to revolve. So it was a revolving canvas. Mm -hmm. And he had friends call him periodically throughout the day and tell him stories. And he would listen to the story, write down the words, and the words are sewn into this revolving canvas 
in such a way like like um, bold words and lightly written mm-hmm, words mm-hmm. that when you stand back, create an image. And you yes. don't even know that it's made up of words until you get really close. Uh, it's truly amazing. And none of my explanation is going to do it justice. So we will show this to you. But yeah, his just just to wrap our brain around the concepts, you know, I wanted to describe it. One of his series is series is series. Yeah. Series. Mm-hmm. One of them was called Goodbye Art, wherein he determined that he could only create things that would self-destruct or deteriorate afterwards <laughs> so that there was like nothing left. It wasn't oh made to God. exist in the world long after. It was made to exist for a short period. Um, examples of that, he tattooed a banana using a push pin. So again, with the small dots, he essentially did pointillism on the banana. Mm -hmm. And of course, and then he would use like a time-lapse camera to capture eventually the banana rotted and his artwork was gone. He made an incredible Jimi Hendrix image out of matches and then (sighs) lit it up. Set it on fire! Yes. So through this process, what he originally thought of as limitation became a liberation. And he Mm. stopped focusing on the end result Mm. and the presentation so much as the process of creativity. Mm. And, And doing that, he just had like idea after idea after idea. And you can see so much of his stuff on fillinthecircle.com, Phil being P H I L, fillinthecircle.com. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's so, it's what's so incredible is that you think like he almost didn't pursue this due to the limitation of his hand, but he really put it best. We must first be limited in order to become limitless. Ah, uh, interesting, interesting concept to let that sit with you for a second. There's a really famous Hemingway story that illustrates the idea of con- uh, constraints in creativity. No one is really 100% sure how this went down or if it went down or if it was actually Hemingway. So that's why there's a little reservation in my voice. But the story, nonetheless, is attributed to Hemingway. You might, you may have heard it. Um, but the story that many people like to tell is that there's some wager among friends, supposedly. Hemingway claims that he can write a complete emotionally devastating story in six words. Yes. Right? And everyone yes. ponies up 10 bucks and they're like, yeah, we'll see. And he wait, they wait for him to deliver the story. So then he thinks, he writes on a piece of paper, um, and then he passes it around. And one by one, each of his friends reads the piece of paper, slowly nods, and then hands Slides over their 10, 10 bucks. <laughs> bucks, right? I love this. And the piece of paper he sent around said, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Mm. And so people like, I mean, I think that's a devastating story. Like the first time I ever heard that was like, yeah. oh my God, I would never have guessed how much emotion you could cram into six words. Yeah. Um, But... You know, I don't know if that's true, but it's definitely a fun story. And the general concept of telling a story with the bare minimum of words is called flash fiction. It's a super fun way to put a limitation on yourself, flash fiction. The idea actually has spawned a popular take called six word memoirs. Have you heard of this? (gasps) Six I've word done memoirs? a six word yes. memoir. So yes. it's so fun. Six word memoirs, I think. This is where like, well, a lot of people have done it, but also they have books um, where famous people have written like their six word autobiographies or now people write memoirs about just about anything. There's the website sixwordmemoirs.com. It's filled with all kinds of topics. They now have six words in school, like classroom materials. It's really amazing. Yeah. But for those of you who haven't experienced it, a few fun celebrity autobiographies. Stephen Colbert's six words are, well, I thought it was funny. (laughs) Amy Mann. Amy Mann says, couldn't cope, so I wrote songs. Mm. Lynn Manuel Miranda, immigrants, we get the job done. Wow. Liz Gilbert, 
Me See World, Me Write Stories. Hmm. Amy Tan, she wrote uh, The Joy Luck Club. Her six words are, former boss, quote, writing's your worst skill. (sighs) Ha. (laughs) And Deepak Chopra, danced in field of infinite possibilities. Hmm. It's so amazing. And their tagline for the six word memoirs is one life, six words, what's yours? Nice. So, um, so super fun. So that got me thinking and I was like, oh, like what came to me instantly was like, um, learn to fear less, create more or loved life by fearing less, you know, things in that realm. And right now they're doing a six word contest as they often do. And this one is hashtag life during Corona in six words. Ooh. I think that if you hashtag and post on social, they may feature yours, but a few examples from their website that I, I think are, are really, I don't know, fun. I don't know if that's the right word for Corona, but um, their fan Imitaz says, now just normalcy would feel extraordinary. Mm. Now just normalcy would feel extraordinary. Uh, Mina Marina says, on my screen, never in person. E day 0609 says united as one, but not together. Wow. Really cool. Right. And of course that got me thinking, all right, so what would my life during Corona six words be? And I came up with two just, you know, quickly, but my first one was embrace technology or risk falling behind. Hmm. And then my second one was needing, but can't allow myself rest. (laughs) That's how I'm feeling in this particular moment about Corona. I need some rest, but I can't, like, I can't afford to let myself have it. Amazing. While you were talking, I I had the luxury because we're in front of our computers yes. and we're not together. I looked up my six word memoir oh my and God. I, I performed at an evening of other um, six word memoirs yeah, yeah, yeah. where you gave your uh, six word title essentially and then unpacked the story behind it. Oh, neat. Um, yeah. And I think I called it something else, but this is my favorite of the list because I made several options. Yeah. Um, and I won't unpack the story. But uh, this this six word memoir was that showboat tried to kill me. Ah, that's <laughs> awesome! What a great idea to like have people use the six words to title it and then tell the story. Yeah, because it's really a great way for writers if you want to get to the heart of what exactly you're trying to say. It's a really yes. helpful exercise. It's almost like a log line, right? It, it is almost, but. It's even better. Like a log <laughs> line has to fulfill like a number of things, yes, like what yes. change happens and how the person evolves and blah, blah, blah. But you, those six words are really the essence of your story. It, once you start doing it, it's really fun to like think in oh, six words. Oh, yeah, I love this. So I think it's super, super fun. But there's, for writers, there's like a million different writing constraints you can try. So obviously there's sonnets and iambic pentameter and haiku. And haiku. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's like, there's a million ways that people have come up with for, for writers to spark your creativity um, and use different parts of their brain. It was actually a writing challenge, supposedly, that tested this overall theory about constraints and creativity. Um, apparently, story has it, Dr. Seuss's publisher challenged him to write a book using only 50 different words. What? Yeah. What? You know what he came up with? Uh, Green eggs and ham. Oh, really? Green eggs and ham. And it's his most- Hop on pop? Hop on pop. No. The Lorax. No. Green eggs and ham. Green eggs and ham. And it's his most popular book of all time. According to an article on nextavenue.com, the green eggs and ham theory- has become a confirmed scientific hypothesis. Using experimental methods, scientists tested the hypothesis and learned that constraints actually do fuel creativity in all kinds of creativity. So we recently posted on our Instagram, thanks Austin Sargent, 
Um, Hi, Austin. Hi, Austin. We posted a story about a British artist named David Hockney. According to the New York Times, um, in an article by Ted Luz, David challenged himself to create using only his iPhone and his iPad and Mm. what he could see outside his window. That's it. Mm. So for him, based in his location in Normandy, he features nature, weather, and anything his little eye can spy out the window. But it's the same window view every day. And then he creates an image using his iPad and his and his phone, his iPhone. This is amazing. This is the David Hockney. The David Hockney? The David Hockney. This is his latest thing that he's Okay, doing. this is what I love. David Hockney is 82 years old. Yes, he's an he incredibly is. well-established artist who is probably most famous for like his swimming pool paintings, I would think. Probably. But, but this is a person, an 82-year-old, who is sort of like, I this is what I'm on to now. I'm on to making this art using digital technology. Like this is amazing. That's right. Like this my iPad some, and some my iPhone. Young whippersnapper. It is not. It is not. Wow. And he David said, um, you know, he takes heart in the simple pleasures of the outside world. And although other activities might be shut down right now, quote, nobody can cancel the spring. Nature just goes on relentlessly, I'm glad mm. to say. So he kind of Mm. went with the limitations, like he's apparently he's in the country right now and at his, you know, at a place in Normandy and he's essentially working with what he's got. So the materials he has are his iPhone and his iPad and his view out the window. Nature. And also nobody can cancel the spring is a great five word memoir for coronavirus. Nobody can cancel the spring. Nobody can cancel the spring. That is an amazing five word memoir for this time. That is the truth. That is the truth. Amazing. So that's a good example for quarantine. Like you could, it might be a photo photo a day out your window or a painting or drawing only what you can see, you know, using the medium of your choice. Um, were you a fan of Project Runway from the beginning, Suze? Yes, girl. Okay, yes. I know you're going to know this, but the unconventional challenge is I a favorite love. because of the limitations. That's right. Like sometimes you can only use products from the party store to make a dress or to make an outfit or the grocery store. The and grocery store. In the, the very vegetable first section. Season. Yes. yes. I will never forget the dress made out of corn husks by Austin Scarlett. Do you remember will, that? Do I remember it? Camion, let me tell you this. That is when... Uh, you know, on different seasons of Project Runway, they have different uh, partnership sponsorships, uh-huh. and they were partnering with Banana Republic. Uh-huh. And I used to walk to work through the Rockefeller Center yes. uh, underground, and Banana Republic in their window would feature whatever <gasps> outfit had won, like on Project One. Re- on a project runway the night before. And the, I saw the corn dress in uh, person. Uh, amazing. Yes. So if you didn't watch, it was a dress, a cocktail dress made out of husks from corn. And what was what added to the drama that they could not have planned is that, you know, they finished the dress the night before. The next morning they can put <laughs> final touches on it. But yes. he did this amazing dress in corn husks, which was like Beautiful. exquisite. Yeah. And overnight, the corn husk kind of dried and of shriveled course. a bit. Yeah. Like no one, like he didn't expect, no one was thinking that that would happen overnight. So he arrives the next morning and it looks like maybe the dress that hasn't, isn't going to survive. But then you see it on the runway and it is transformed, but it is still glorious. Yeah. It was like magic. It was really yeah. magic and such an incredible display of imagination through limitation. Mm. Austin Scarlet. Mm. And so right now it's no surprise. Like there's definitely people doing fashion challenges online with only what yes. they have. This hashtag quarantine couture, which we also posted about this pillow challenge, which, which I have to admit, I don't know a lot about, but I keep seeing people posting their pillow dresses. 
uh, Anne Hathaway did something recently, but what, like with a pillowcase? Uh, it's the entire pillow, and like they belt it, and it looks like from if you photograph from the front, it looks like a dress. And I'm not what? sure what's behind it, but someone can feel free to like fill us in. I'll I'll, I'll look it up. But yeah, amazing. It's really amazing. So this leads me to creative limitations. What do we make of it? Oh, I think that we are living in a moment where creative limitations are going to have a just they're going to shine. Sauce. They're going to yeah. have their moment. Right. So there's anything from like ch- uh, challenge yourself to use the the leftover art supplies from previous projects or choose three Mm. things from your supply closet and make something out of them. Um, That reminded me of like, if you do makeup tutorials, like try using only the bits and bobs, you know, in your makeup drawer, get those, you know, do something creative um, with all of those leftover makeup palettes that you never use. Um, as a writer, you can give yourself time limits. You can enter the 48 hour film project or the 24 hour plays or the 24 hour short stories. Like time constraints are really popular and very effective. Um, when space is limited, have you ever seen, um, there are many artists, but one, um, is an artist named Heidi Annalise and she does these tiny canvases, um, tiny landscape paintings inside of like a mint tin, like an yes. Altoids tin. Right? I love them. I love I them. I love them so much. Yeah. So you don't need a lot of space for this, right? She just opens it up and um, on the back of the lid, there's um, what I think is probably, um, you know, a, just a small cut piece of paper there um, as the can, the tiny mini canvas, and then the paints yes. go in the bottom. Yes. It's easy to travel anywhere. You can step outside and paint with very, very little with you. Mm. Um, you can limit your palette to three colors. If you're writing music, you give yourself a challenge to re-envision a, a current song, either with different instruments or a different arrangement. Um, I even read about people who use a limitation of sleep, which is maybe a bit more risky, but I'll tell you about Mm. this one. I would just be careful. But um, there's an, according to an article in the guardian by Stuart Jeffries, there was an art exhibit called jet slag around the world in seven sleeps and artist Alice Vandeleur Borer took part in a sleep deprivation study, lived in a lab for 10 days without natural light or any knowledge of time and advancing her body clock by four hours a night in order to sleep outside of the normal 24 hour circadian rhythm, which we know about because of you, Susan. Mm. Um, but then took photographs and, um, and created artistic pieces that show the disturbingly like disorienting effects that the experiment had on her. So just really trying to imagine like, okay, these are the limitations that I'm working with. How can I make it a creative challenge? Amazing. I I do. Yeah. I'm struck. There, there are two things that I'm thinking about. Number one is there's something that I saw on Instagram and I could not stop watching it. Um, it was a series and I can't remember who produced it, but it was a series where they sent home design influencers and, um, crafters, they would send them an object in a box and a challenge that they had to make something for the home out of it. Uh, they had to transform it in some way. Interesting. And, and these creative people would take stuff and make stuff out of it. So the two that I saw, one, they sent a thrift store clock that had, instead of numbers, it was pictures of vegetables that maybe someone had in their kitchen in the 80s or something like that. Uh-huh. Just total <laughs> like thrift store <laughs> bull crap. It's the kind of stuff that I would just, I wouldn't even touch it. I wouldn't even pick it up. But that's what they received in their box. And they took it apart. They saved the clock workings for another project for another day, but they took the round wooden frame and they made the coolest planter on their wall for these little, um, 
germinating seedlings that were in sort of test tubes with water. Oh my God. It was gorgeous. And then somebody else got just like a plain sort of jute, if you can picture that, like a plain jute tan colored mat that you would put outside a door. And they took it and they made this really, really cool rainbow welcome mat. So they cut it and they said it was surprisingly easy to cut. And then they stenciled it off and they chose colors that they loved and they painted it and it looked amazing. It looked absolutely amazing. You know what amazes me about projects like that? Like anytime you're using a recycled piece and you're going to turn it, you're going to transform it into something else. A lot of times you get one shot at that. So yes. if you, yeah. if that messes up in some way, then you have to create a new vision for the pieces yes. that you have left. I'm always amazed by that. That's, you really are that's challenged very on Project top of Runway. Yeah. That's Project Runway when they're like, this is a make, when Tim Gunn says, this is a make it work moment. Yep. That's exactly what he's talking about, where it's sort of like you have maybe painted yourself into a corner, yep. the clock is ticking, and you have to figure out a way to creatively resolve this. You're and out sometimes, of fabric. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Someone's yes. on the sewing machine that you want to use, make it work. Yes, that's right. Um, that's another thing true. that it's making me think of is, um, Cam's, you know, that you and I have been doing, um, a lot of work with the good teachers at the Columbia, Missouri public school district, right. all their arts that's educators, right. amazing, amazing group of people. And they're feeling the pain of, you know, lives traditional school being canceled and having go having to go to a technical model technological model I should say and a virtual model and something that I when we were preparing to do this work with them something that our friend James Melton said was you know the teachers are really you know, grieving during this time and they're grieving on behalf of their students as well. For instance, there are students that didn't take home their band instruments. Mm -hmm. They didn't get their instruments out of the classroom before school got locked down. And so it's hard to teach them even to do a, like a private music lesson with a student because they don't have their instruments. And the whole time you've been talking, I've been thinking, what, even with these limitations, what can be done? What, can what they could make? be done? Yes. What could be made of it, even in the absence of your clarinet? Like what could be made of it? I'm going to learn to play the spoons. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> there are still things that can be taught. There There's still things. music theory that can yes, be taught. And, yes. and maybe it's like, so you don't have your clarinet. Maybe you make one out of paper towel rolls so that you can practice the fingering. I don't know. I'm making yeah. all of this up, but yeah. I, I love this spark so <laughs> yes. much. I love I when love, you love my sparks. I, it makes I, me so giddy. Well, that's good because I love your sparks a lot. So <laughs> it th- this is this is so, 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 so good. Well, the cool thing is there are literally no limits to the ways that you can limit yourself. <laughs> Use limitation. No, there's no, like there's just so many ways. And maybe we put the limits on ourselves or maybe the world puts the limits on us. But it really becomes about our mindset, you know, can we learn to see the limitation as a challenge or as an inspiration, as Mm. an avenue for new thinking and new exploration? Can we have a sense of humor about it or can we let it drive us? Orson Welles supposedly said, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. (gasps) The enemy of art is the absence of limitations. I propose that we conquer our enemies by embracing the limitations that surround us, perhaps what is missing will be the substance that defines what we're able to make. Oh, Camion. God damn, that's a good spark. Uh, There's so much. Honestly, I didn't even go into, there are architects, Frank Gehry, Frank Lloyd Wright, these architects who will literally go on and on and on about how it's almost impossible for them to work without a limitation or a challenge. So yeah. people think that what they want is, I want for, I want creative freedom, but that yeah. creates paralysis of choice. So the more yeah. options, the harder it is to choose. So 
having a problem, a clearly defined problem that you are trying to solve is solving so a problem. Yes. You know where I love, so it sounds like it lives pretty much in all forms. It lives yeah. in all creative forms. Yep. Um, you know where I love it and I, I, I just love it is in interior design. Oh, that's where I yes. love. I have lived. I lived for like 20 years in a, a studio apartment that was so small and so beautiful. Oh, and I loved that apartment so much. And too. one of the cool things about that apartment was how do you get creative? How do you address the limitations in terms of, you know, lack of space, lack of square footage? You did footage. such an incredible job too. Like uh, when I say you utilized every yeah. single, like once and I will still talk about it. It would be like, well, you know, remember how Susan did it in um, her apartment? Like there's a place for everything and every place has a purpose and it's clear and And I worked upon. on it. I worked on it until the day I left that apartment. I, it was a, bless you. We're going to have to keep that Thank in. You. It's gotta it, stay. it was a, t <laughs> it's a total, it was a total work in progress, but I enjoy those puzzles. So I, I respond to that. I really oh, love, I that love place. your spark. Mm -mm -mm. I love your spark. I love yours. I can't wait to hear. Um, I can't wait to hear what yours is. Well, because we're not editing, it means we're not taking a break. <gasps> so I hope you don't have to pee. Oh That's my right. God. We didn't think and this through. It also means that we're going to do our own sting, right? Because we're not editing. So it goes like this. The spark file. The spark file. And we're back. Hey. Welcome it's back, It's like we Cam went to the bathroom, but we didn't. <laughs> well, come back, to go back, well. Do you need to go to the bathroom? No, but I am going to take a sip of this water. Enjoy. Me too. Me too. Enjoy this, listeners. Oh. ASMR. Oh. Look, mm -hmm. if we didn't have this limitation, you wouldn't have this ASMR right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here we go. So um, a, a few quick uh, spark sources uh, for me, a piece on NPR by Yuki Noguchi, a piece on medium.com by Melody Wilding, Wikipedia, but mostly this spark today comes straight out of my motherfucking life, yo. Woohoo! Yeah. So out your butt. The, straight out your butt. Straight out of my butt. I like it. Um, when the pandemic struck, many of us began to quarantine. And let me just interrupt my spark that I just started to say. Uh, b did you know that the word quarantine originates from the Venetian of the Italian, the Venetian dialect from Italian, quaranta, meaning 40, and quarantina? What? means 40 days. I've seen two things. I've seen Quarantina and I've seen Quaranta Giorno, but um, please enjoy my bullshit Italian accent. I really love but it. According to one source, Quarantina means 40 days. And during the 14th and 15th centuries, which Camion, help me out, is the 1300s and 1400s? <laughs> Is that right? It is the 1300s and the 1400s. Okay. I'm so excited. Thanks. It's you always a risk. You are learning. I never know whether to go forward or back. Okay. So during the 1300s and the 1400s, why don't we just call it the 1300s and the 1400s? Damn I know. Um, Quarantina designated the period that all ships were required to be isolated before passengers and crew could go ashore during the Black Plague. Oh my God. God. Epidemic. That's yes. what we're talking about because people would carry the plague from place to place. That's right. So, so they have to, to stay on the ship. Yep. The ship pulls into port and, you know, I guess the Black Death is what it was called during that time. Um, the Black Plague and the Black Death. I don't know if they're the same thing, but uh, during the Black Death, ships would pull into port and everybody had to stay on board for 40 days. 40 days. Wrap your mind around it, people. 40 days. I'm so, so curious that, uh, how they came up with 40 days. I mean, obviously it was based in whatever science they knew then. So they knew that exactly. you would die within 40 days or I you wonder, would recover. Though, in the 13s and 13 and 1400s, their science, were they like, oh, um, we think it's uh, bad spirits. And well, their science might have just been the spirits are going to take you within 40 days if they're going to take you. I mean, so you know, they could have just... I mean, just by observation, I, I don't know what they would attribute it to, but by observation, they may have obviously figured out that there's a span of time that you're either going to die or you're going to recover. You know what that span of time is? 
Quarantina. Quarantina. <laughs> Quarantina. So right off the bat, heads up, everybody. Here's one of the greatest sparks to ever fly out of this podcast. Woo! Quarantina would be an excellent drag queen name. And after a quick <laughs> Google search, I've heard people throw I've heard people throw the term around, but it doesn't appear to be taken as an official drag name. And the URL is available for four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. So somebody get the fuck on that hand. Wait, how much? Okay. Four thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. And are you saying it's quarantina? Tina dot com. Yes. yes. It's a yes. good drag name. But I digress. Okay. Back to the quarantine. Okay. Okay. So I noticed something about myself and others during these Q times. I noticed that <laughs> some people were healthy and their loved ones were healthy, but they were having a really challenging time. And some people, like myself, we're having a fairly okay time. Now, there are a lot of factors that have gone into that. I'm healthy. I feel safe in my home. Not everyone has that. That's right. And I, I also have companionship and I have two stinky dogs that bring me a lot of comfort. Again, not everyone has two stinky dogs and companionship. Um, but I have close friends who have been sick mm -hmm. and isolated through this or healthy, but quarantined alone. And I think that in and of itself is rough. Oh God. That and is here's hard. another caveat. I was slash am genuinely scared by the potential for loss during this pandemic, all sorts of loss, loss of health, loss of safety, loss of life, loss of loved ones, loss, loss of, of work, health loss insurance. of income. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Loss yeah. of financial solvency, loss and loss and loss. When all of this shiz started, I was experiencing very, very vivid fears. Mm. Um, but I kept doing this thing with myself where I would just kind of compassionately drag myself back into the present moment and I would check in with myself. And I was reminded that I was actually safe and healthy in the present moment. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't destitute. I've used I that a lot, Susan, since you've told me about that, I will stop uh, myself and be like, but I am safe on. right now. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I, that, no, no, that's, I'm glad it's been helpful to you. It's something that I learned from my cr friend, Craig Thompson years ago, he was experiencing these excruciating panic attacks. And then he started to do this thing where he would just kind of disrupt himself in mm -hmm. the middle of it and go, wait a second you are safe and well. Yeah. You're safe and well. In this moment, you're safe and well. Mm -hmm. So I started just adopting that. And when I have done it, and I, I was exposed to the virus, but I didn't get super sick. So I don't know, did I have it? Did I not have it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So for the majority of this time, I've been healthy, question mm -hmm. mark. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that, but I recognize that almost all of my fears were fears of potential outcomes yeah. that weren't actually happening. They were future fears. Mm -hmm. uh, and those fears included things like fear that my parents were going to get sick, fear that Nathan was going to get sick, fear that <sighs> I was going to get sick, fear yeah. around money running out, fear yeah. that food was going to run out, a lot of future uh, scarcity panic yep. and fear of loss. And an interesting side spark, so many of those future fears I was seeing so clearly in my mind's eye. So much of that footage that I was rolling was borrowed from the past. It was oh. images of war and famine and depression era bread lines. That and you didn't even live through, but just some vivid of, many, images. many of them. Yes. Many of them I had not even lived through. Some mm -hmm. of them I had, I mean, I've mm -hmm. lived through uh, September 11th in New York yep. city. Yep. I've lived through week long blackouts and isolation in New York city. So I was borrowing some trauma and B roll from my past, uh -huh. but almost all of my future fears were B roll from the past. And most of that, like you said, Cammie, and it wasn't even my past. Wow. Now, maybe those things might happen in the future, and maybe those things might eventually be history repeating, or maybe not. I don't know. Right. But when I keep coming into the present moment, so far, I'm okay. I'm safe in this moment. And in this moment, 
and in this moment. Yes. And then my fear starts to diminish and my feelings become more tolerable. Mm -hmm. So a friend of the podcast, Jason Jaggard, who is a wonderful teacher and coach. Hi, uh, Jason. Wants Hi, Jason. He once sparked me, Amadeus, with this gem. He said this, <laughs> there is a dark side of the imagination, fear and worry. Fear and worry are a form of creative thinking. What if we use imagination to create instead of worry? And it really struck me because I was like, oh yeah, he's right. Fear and worry can be wildly creative. Um, but that's why when we define creativity, we say uh, applied imagination that fights for the powers of good because we don't want to energize that amongst other things. That's right. Yeah. But the very power that like makes you a good actor is that ability to use your imagination, yes. conjure Kimmy, you're up, so right. right? You're conjuring up imaginary yeah. circumstances that you're not actually living through. Um, and you're emoting as though you are, and yes. it's so difficult to try to refine that skill as a performer and then shut yes. that skill off when you're off yes. stage. You make a beautiful point. That's Thank such a you. good point. I can't argue that. So um, so at the beginning of this whole COVID-19 adventure, before I could even catch myself, I was definitely, I was giving in to the dark side of my imagine, my imagination and I was giving it free reign. And I knew if I was going to make it through this pandemic marathon, I had to, like you were saying, Camion, maybe I've really exercised that imagination as an actor, but I had to get a handle on my thinking yep. in this day-to-day -day real life reality. That's right. And so- I did. I tried to stay in the present moment. I consciously count my blessings and I really check in with myself when my fears begin to rise up and my outlook has really gotten better. And I also, I will say this, I've really limited my news and my news sources. Oof, good that idea. has also been a real game changer for me because I was drinking in all of it. And I got to tell you, it wasn't helping. So now mm -hmm. I just try to take in um, the responsible amount so that I can be informed and move through the world uh, from, with scientific knowledge without completely just taking it all in and saturating myself. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, so once, once I got my, uh, my arms around this quarantine has actually been, I'm going to say it. And I even feel guilty saying it, but kind of wonderful for me mm -hmm. because why? Because Susan loves to be at home. Mm -hmm. I always have, I have since I was a kid, yeah. um, to that end for years, I've had the spark about wanting to have location flexibility, wanting to teach remotely instead of flying all over the world to teach. And then all of a sudden, almost all of my teaching work converted to remote online workshops. So my dream was made real and the world was sort of put in a position to have to buy into it yeah. um, or not. I mean, some, some clients were like, thanks, we'll catch you on the other side of quarantine storms. And I was like, peace, bye. But the majority have um, converted it to online. Seriously. And that's yeah. some powerful manis manifestation abilities right there. I just, don't know. I'm if joking. I just I'm, feel I'm like just joking. Cause of course you can't <laughs> change the whole I, world. <laughs> No, you, I don't I think you brought a pandemic on. I don't think I did either, but I think that I have had that in my mind for so long yeah. when the opportunity presented itself. I was like, yes, please. Yeah. So yeah. as a result, you and I are teaching all of these people who are located all over the world. Yeah. And I think being of real service to them yes. and even with the, to borrow from your spark, limitations of technology, yeah. providing them genuinely transformative experiences and we're doing it all without leaving our houses. And I <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, both Nathan and Can I just say a I, six yeah. word thing? Can I just say yes. a six word? Without yeah. leaving your house, you thrive. I just without made that up. Without leaving your house, you thrive. But it's really you. Like without leaving my house, I thrive. I love that six word <laughs> memoir. Just, and it's true. It and it's so funny. Head. I feel guilty. I, I feel guilty even saying it, but I, 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 okay, here's the deal. 
Nathan and I are stone cold introverts. So all of this is totally on brand. And if you're an extrovert, this must be one of those rare times when you're getting the fuzzy end of the introvert extrovert lollipop. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of the time the world is, uh, favors extroverts, but it's more than just this. It's more than just this. In the last month, I realized something else that was making my work from home times more enjoyable. It's that in a way I have been training for this marathon. Mm, You have. Yes. I knew how to structure my days and my work from home. Like it was my job because I have had a few years of practice, Mm -hmm. but that wasn't always the case. This is all stuff I've learned relatively recently. So that's why my spark today is titled how to work from home, AKA be your own boss, like a boss. Oh Great. my God. What a title. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Before I, <laughs> before I go any further, I want to acknowledge what, what a privilege it is to get to have a safe space to quarantine and work from. That's not the case for everyone. And what a privilege it is to get to be at home. There are so many essential workers who are literally risking their lives every day so that it's possible for people like us to stay at home, which is one of the reasons I get so frustrated when people won't do their part to flatten the curve. But I digress back to working from home like a boss. So (laughs) a little backstory for years from the time I was a baby through kindergarten, elementary, middle, high school, college, graduate school, and then on into my corporate career, which lasted for decades. I have always relied on and thrived in external structure. So from the time I was no years old until the time I was about 47 years old, other people informed me where I should be, when I should be there. And I really, really, really respond well to that. And then at 47, I started working for myself. And for the first time in my life, I had to create my own structure And if I'm honest, one of the main reasons it took me so long to work for myself is because I was so uncertain about how to provide myself with daily structure. Mm, True story. True story. I was so scared that I wouldn't be able to successfully provide myself with that structure. I was like, maybe next year for a really long time. Yeah. So- It took me years to figure out how to structure my days and work with the same discipline I would have if I was working for someone else. That struggle was so struggly, y'all. But I, I, it was. The struggle was struggly. The struggle was struggly, but I figured out some things that work for me. And while I'm constantly refining it, I thought it might be helpful to share some of these things with you all Mm -hmm. in case you have been slammed into like a work from home situation, or maybe you're a new freelancer who's trying to figure it all out. For instance, if you are recently, like in the last, maybe you recently graduated from college and you're like, I'm a new freelancer in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Or maybe you made a recent career transition to freelance and now you're like, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're an artist or a creative or an entrepreneur or a person who's facing a bunch of free time and you want to provide yourself with more structure. So mm-hmm. whoever you are, if this is useful to you, here are some tools for how to live like a freelance creative and be your own boss like a boss. <laughs> okay, first up, I give you this. Morning rituals. I recently received an email from Mark Fisher of Mark Fisher Fitness. Mark Fisher Fitness, my beloved Jim, Mark Fisher, my beloved, beloved. Uh, Mark is a great person and a great entrepreneur and a creator. He's really, really got his shit together. He gets shit done. In fact, he teaches a time management course called Time Ninja, which he's been offering online virtually. Oh, how Um, smart. Yeah, which is probably, he, he, he is a time ninja and he also he does so much. And he also seems to find time to genuinely enjoy his life and relax. 
So that's I a want to skill. read to you from. That is a serious it, skill. And thank you for that's sharing this I'm, with us. I may, not, I may yeah. not have mastered that skill yet, but you know, we're all working on it. in progress. Working yeah. On. So his email said, I wanted to share something I've noticed about my mostly good days versus my not so great days during quarantine lockdown. It's totally simple and something I do every day in the real world. And I was not doing it consistently for the first few weeks of the quarantine. This misstep, I believe, led to a bump your roller coaster ride. In a world where you can't control a lot of things, you can usually control how you start your day. Mm. His email goes on. Based on your living situation, particularly if you have young kids, you may not have complete control over the beginning of your day. But for those who can, the magic of a morning routine is twofold. Number one, by identifying high value activities in advance, you can create big impact on your well-being and the outcomes you actually want. And number two, and this is important, you start your day with integrity by doing the thing you said you were going to do. Yes. I Yeah. I think this last one might be a, the real kicker. If you start your day by veering from your plans, it is not the best feeling. So Mark went on to say that a person's morning routine is very personal. Your morning activities might include things like journaling, gratitude lists, prayer, a morning walk, exercise, or any number of nourishing choices. Mark described his morning routine and it's pretty simple. Immediately upon waking, he meditates for 20 minutes. He reads for 30 to 60 minutes while drinking coffee and his morning greens. He works on what he calls some high value task or tasks in one or two 30 to 60 minute blocks. And he, like writing, is a high value task for him. And in, and in fact, the, this email that I was reading was one of the things that he had drafted during this morning time. Uh, Mark said he was dedicated to this ritual for years. And then after the lockdown got locked down, his consistency fell off. And instead of meditating upon waking, he found himself just checking in quickly on the New York Times first thing upon waking up, mm -hmm. which would lead to this spiral rabbit hole of 90 to six, uh, 90 to 120 minutes, at which point he would look up at the, at the clock, feel uh. shitty about, yeah, feel shitty about having spent his morning being compulsive and not doing what he had planned to do. But once he realized that he had slippy slipped away from his morning ritual, he got his arms back around it. And he said, as a result, he's been in a much better mindset all day long. He said this, and I think this is super important to be clear. This is not about over-functioning productivity chasing. It's more about being the kind of person that does what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. I think that's a super important distinction during Huge. this time, as you yeah. said in your spark about you're doing enough, yeah. like this is not about like, I've got to write King Lear. It's about no. doing what you said you were going to do. It's about integrity essentially. And, it, and, and once you realize like the freedom is there to the thing you say you're going to do can be anything. You yeah. can get up and say, I'm going to get up tomorrow and every day and I'm going to first thing, enjoy a cup of coffee and I'm going to let myself do it for yes. 20 minutes. Yes. And that can be the thing that you're doing. Like it doesn't have to, like he says, like it doesn't have to be like, here's my top five productivity tips for the first 20 minutes of your day. It's about simply doing what you said you were going to do, yeah. allowing yourself to do it, and then feeling good about having done it. 100%. That's he, awesome. Uh, yeah. He concluded the email by saying, if you've been struggling to start your day off in a way you truly love, his hope is that tomorrow you'll get to enjoy the magic of a fresh start. I loved this email for a number of reasons. Number one, it describes the power of the morning ritual. Keeping that commitment to yourself gets you off on the right foot. Number two, it's an honest depiction of how you can be a strong, structured, disciplined maker, creative, freelancer, entrepreneur, and something like all of this rapid change, you can get that flaming curveball thrown at you and it can still blow your butt off, even if like historically you've been really disciplined and really rock solid. And the other thing that I love about this is every single day you get a reset. If you fall off the pony, which I often do in one way or another, if we are lucky enough to live another day, you get another chance. You get another shot. And I love that. I it's love that. so true. 
Wow. Yeah. I, so I Cam's, really like his take on it. Yeah. What? What's your, I, here's a two part question mm-hmm. for you. Part one, do you have a morning ritual that's leading the witness? I know mm-hmm. you do, but mm-hmm. I'd love for you to talk about it. And part two is, have you ha- been able to maintain it during Q times? I adjusted mine. I'll tell you, um, one being with Wes, who I love dearly, we have a ritual when we're together in the same place. Cause, cause I travel a lot for work as well and mm-hmm. bounce back mm-hmm. and forth. So when we're together, our morning ritual, please don't laugh. If you're listening and you laugh, I won't know. Um, <laughs> but, but I will be mad at you. But he's a performer and works most nights doing a show. So mm-hmm. our time together is really in the morning. And I struggled against this for a long time because I had this idea of like, but these are my most productive hours. I must get up and must do something. Mm-hmm. And finally relinquished that and was like, you know what we like to do in the morning? It's coffee with Bud. We call each other Bud, which is, I'm sorry. <laughs> now the world knows. So it's just coffee with Bud is going to be the first Aww. thing that we do. And if it's nice out, we'll walk around with our coffee. Um, like and- in your gym jams? I'm not going to lie. Yes. Sometimes I'm in my jammies. I mean, I'll throw a sweater on or something, but yeah. This is great. I'm, I'm amazed. I could, that, I could not have that be my first thing. If you paid me cash money to stand up and walk around outside. Really? That's oh, off to you. When we're, when we're in Florida, it's, it's a lovely treat. So we just fill up our coffee cups, go out, walk around outside or sit, sit outside. And I like have relinquished this pressure for myself. What I've changed my, my, um, my commitment for myself is that I will get to my computer an hour before whatever my first meeting is. And typically my first meetings at nine 30. So I get to my oh, computer by eight 30. So that's then I, wonderful. yeah. So then I have that hour to get myself organized, think about my priorities for the day. And that's when I like basically turn on the now I'm now I'm being productive. But prior to that, I really allow myself this time with Wes because the way that our lives are working right now, I don't know where my day is going to take me. I'm probably mm. going to work more hours than I plan on. Um, and then I'm going to have some things, you know, after I'm done working that I need to work on and some creative projects that I want to do. So like that morning time has kind of become what I think a lot of people probably have in the evenings or, or on the weekends together. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's that it's changed a little bit, but because, now I feel because, really vulnerable and self-conscious that I shared all that and we're not editing oh, this episode, so I can't take it out. It. I think <gasps> it's wonderful because you essentially, because Wes works nights, you work with a shift worker. And when yeah. you have my mom and dad were both, uh, my dad and mom both worked, I think second shift. Mm-hmm. And when you are living with people who work those second and third shifts, you adjust your life so that you get to have that quality yeah. time. And if coffee with Bud is that quality time, that it sounds is. phenomenal. Because after the show, so he does a show at night and comes home pretty amped up, you know, as performers mm-hmm. do, like you're exhilarated, it felt, mm-hmm. you know, or you're yeah. exhausted, but basically, you know, uh, there's sometimes like a little time after that, but it's really decompression time for him to you know, release the, the performance of the night and then, you know, and then get to bed essentially. That's, that's what we got. I love it. I, you don't have to, I don't feel, you can feel however you want to feel that your feelings, you can feel them, but I I think it's wonderful. And I mean it when I say hats off to you for hauling your ass outside. I could not do that for $1 million. Well, genuinely, I'm not dressed. I'm not going to lie. I'm not fully (laughs) dressed when we go. So if this is the moment on the podcast, when you actually revealed that you're a naturalist and (laughs) and you're doing all of this in the the buff. Uh, Not quite in the buff, but yeah, Yeah. it's in my pajamas and a sweater thrown on over. Yeah. Tell me about yours. Yeah. So here's mine. This is what I do in case anybody gives 
a fuck. I wake up, I meditate, I pee, I meditate for 22 minutes. I bullet journal. And in that bullet journaling, I include gratitude. I'll talk more about that in a second. I do a look back and I assess the prior day's habits. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then I bullet out a list of what I want to accomplish that day. Then I immediately- You're making me look bad. No, because here's the thing, you getting- you're doing just fine, Camion. The other thing I wanted to say about your morning ritual is you get a tremendous amount of things done in your day. So it's working for you. So yeah. rock the fuck on. Okay. Um, so after I do that bullet list, I exercise, then I shower, I dress all the way to my shoes. Nice. Now I don't put on business clothes, but I'm not in my jammies <laughs> and I'm not in sweats. And then I usually look like an artist. I usually like have paint clothes on and stuff like that. And then I uh, make breakfast. I clean out the sink. I empty the dishwasher and I'm at my desk usually by 10 a.m. Nice. So that's, yeah. Um, so one of the things that has really, really helped me is that bullet journal piece. And I want to take a closer look at that. Now, I'm a person who has experimented with all sorts of organizational systems. Mm -hmm. Um, Getting things done is a big one for me. Bullet journal uh, right now is really working for me. For those of you who don't know from bullet journaling or Bujo, as the kids are calling it, JK, I don't know that anybody's calling that. (laughs) I saw that in in an article online and I was like, Bujo. Here's a spark. That's a good dog's name. Bujo. Bujo. So this was an organizational approach, I'll call it, started Mm -hmm. by a dude named Ryder Carroll. And if you've ever seen bullet journals online, like on Pinterest, they can get really fucking elaborate and really like a lot of calligraphy and a lot of like lettering and a lot of people practicing their lettering and coloring. And and (laughs) this might, depending on who you are, I don't mean to have a tone in my voice. This You've might strike tone. you as, <laughs> did you take a tone? <laughs> this might strike you as inspiring and wildly creative or intimidating and unnecessarily complex. Writer Carol, who invented Bujo, says, forget about what you see online. It's not about how it looks. It's about how it feels and most mm. importantly, how it works for you. In other words, don't worry if your handwriting looks like chicken scratch. You don't need to learn calligraphy or buy up every supply at the craft store. You just need a clean notebook. I like pages that have sort of um, a grid on them, but at least lined paper I think would be helpful. But as ever, you do you, sparklers. There is a fantastic four-minute video online at bulletjournal.com that teaches you pretty much everything you need to know about bullet journaling in four minutes. Ooh. And But here's how I do mine. As a month is coming to an end, I set up my bujo for the next month. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop trying to get bujo happen. It's so bujo is not happening. I set up my bullet journal for the coming month and here's what I set up. I have one page that is um, just from one, however many days there are in the month, one through 31, one through 28, whatever, every, every one of those days gets a line and anything that I have coming up on the calendar, I just put it on that date slash line. So I start to wrap my mind around what commitments I already have coming up for the month. Mm -hmm. I then set up a page that has an overview of my freelance finances. So that's money that's coming in, bills that are coming up, financial goals, debts that I'm working on paying down. I just sort of have a page that is a as of this moment at the seam of this month, this is what I'm looking at, a financial snapshot, if you Mm -hmm, will. mm -hmm. Then I set up a page for memories from the month. So like last month, when the quarantine erupted, I recorded that. This would also, I thought, be a good section to expand into the captain's log that you talked about yes. in the last episode. Yes, Camille. yes. Um, I, I also have a page that is a gratitude list. It's one line per day. And each day, each morning when I'm doing my bullet journal for the day, I list three things that I'm grateful for. I, I am allowed to repeat myself. So if every day I want to be like, Nathan, 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 puppies, 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 camion, 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 then I do that. And it's nobody's business. Oh, this is riveting. I want to read your diary. Camion, camion, camion. 
Then I make a list each morning of what I want to accomplish that day. And I, throughout the day, I keep my bullet journal on my desk and I cross things off as I complete them. I want to just make it clear. I never get everything done mm -hmm. that I wanted to get done. I, do, I never cross everything off, but things that I don't get done, I sort of circle them and I can forward them on to the next day when I do my bullet journal the following morning. I try to make, take a look back every day to make sure that nothing has fallen through the cracks. And I do a once over at the seam of the month too, to just double check that nothing fell through the cracks. Um, I also, I have a monthly tracker. A lot of creatives and freelancers ask me about this. So I think yeah. it's worth unpacking. Yeah. So I make a grid in my notebook tracking 13 or 14 different elements. So picture this down the left hand side of the page is a list of those things I'm tracking. And across the top of the page are the days of the month, one through 31. The things that I'm tracking are things like water intake, nutrition, exercise, meditation, creation, business development, cleaning slash organizing, finances, learning, gratitude, my period, frankly. Hey. Um, and every morning when use. I do my bullet you news, you can use everybody, <laughs> I'm in the flow. Every morning when I bullet journal, I just look back on the day before and I ask myself, did I drink the water I meant to drink mm -hmm. or did I not do it? Did I meditate twice or did I not do it? And I want to be clear, I am not chastising myself when I'm doing this. I'm just noticing it and bringing my awareness to it. So if I start feeling off, I can just look back and be like, oh no, you're not getting sick, ding dong. You just haven't been drinking water for like four days straight and your brain is desiccated. Drink some water. Mm -hmm. Or no, no, ding dong. You're not losing your mind. You're just actually about to start your period. It's been really, really helpful for me to measure and manage this stuff that's important to me. So just to give you uh, another example of this, we were recently talking to Erica Henningsen and off mic, we were talking about this tracker idea. So something that's super important to her, feeling like she is living her best life is her activism. But that activism is not necessarily baked into her day-to-day -day career unless she requires it of herself. So for instance, if I were Erica and activism is important to me, I would make sure I have activism as one of the things I was tracking just to serve as a daily reminder of what's important to you, but also, right. yeah, like what you're aiming for in this precious brief life. Because it's and not going to magically happen if you don't have that's it right. on your list. Yeah. That's right, because you have to be your own boss, like a boss. Like a ba, boss. Ba, 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 ba. Um, but like Erica was talking about how like after she did her big book drive and after they packed up all the books and shipped them out, the days after that, she was like, why do I feel bad? And Kyle, her boyfriend was like, because that piece of activism, those books are gone and you haven't identified the next thing. So mm -hmm. that's an example of where it's helpful when you're just like, why do I feel that? Is it always going to feel this way? Right. You can be like, no, actually, if you just, um, you haven't been doing your second meditation of the day or whatever that thing is, that's important to you. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is from an article on medium.com written by Melody Wilding. Melody said, according to neuroscientists, a bullet journal helps you externalize thoughts. This frees up mental space so you can think more clearly and concentrate better. You don't have to waste valuable energy remembering everything. Instead, your life is captured on the pages of your journal. Now you can be more present and at ease in the moment without worrying that you're forgetting something. She goes on to say, analog productivity methods like bullet journaling have another advantage over digital tools, better retention. Writing yes. by hand engages multiple senses, visual, kinesthetic, and tactical, which helps commit tasks to memory. It also signals to your brain that your goals are important, making you more likely to follow through. Yeah. So that's how I start my day. Now, as I said, by 10 AM, I get to my day. Oh, another thing I want to add to this. Why? I was reaching, I was recent, I'm going off road. I was okay. recently um, teaching a group of students, wonderful students from Utah State University. Hey, hey. Holla. And um, there was a student who expressed some dismay, graduate student who 
um, you know, was on lockdown at home. His wife was working from home, but he really felt adrift. And he said one of the ways that it was manifesting was um, he was spending first thing in the morning, spending like two hours on Facebook Mm -mm. and just like, uh, yes. And, and you can imagine like that gives me, um, when I do it and you know, I've done it like this sort of like, as I'm just like this sort of low grade sicky feeling. So I could imagine how that was for him. And we made a commitment in the moment. I was like, David, if you take Facebook off your phone, I'll take all my social media off my phone right <gasps> oh, now. Oh, that was a deal you made because I know you just told me you took all that off. That was part of a I deal. I made a deal because <gasps> I was struggling with oh. that too. After I did my bullet journal in the morning, I was doing that thing where I was like, I don't want to get up and start working out or I don't want to yeah. get up and face my day. And I was going into social media on my phone and just fucking off for extended yep. amounts of time. And you and I were talking, um, because we're, as we said, taking this business course right now. And I was like, I need to get some precious time back for rest yep. and for quality time yep. with Nathan and to do things around the house, etc. And I was like, you know where I'm going to get that time back? Social media morning. I'm taking, back, I'm taking back the morning. So thank you, David. And, um, but that's also why you won't see me as on social media media as much because I'm living my life. Okay. So, wow. um, that was a side, side spark. Yep, so yep. that's how I start my day. And now, as I said, by 10 AM, I get to my desk. So let's talk about that workspace, Hannies, as much as you can create a workspace that works for you. And that could be a corner of your basement that has the best Wi-Fi. We've talked about this in past episodes. That could be your claw office. That's your closet office. It could be a corner of the couch that works for you. It could be a workshop, a dance studio, a craft table, a drafting table. It could be a makeup mirror if you're a drag queen, as long as it is functional for you. I will say some of my best work is done in what I call my soft office. When I am writing something that is really like personal from the heart, 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 I do my best writing like that as close to waking as possible. So I keep this really affordable little lap desk tucked really near my bed. Mm -hmm. And once I've done my morning meditation and my bullet journal, a twist on my morning routine is if I'm doing this type of writing, I stay in bed and I use that lap desk with my laptop and some, I will say some of my very best, most personal premium content has been generated in my soft office. And I say that to just acknowledge that everyone is different and everyone has different situations that they're dealing with and different limitations, Cami in. Mm-hmm. So using the resources and assets that you have at your disposal, figure out what works best for you and do that. If you have roommates that are loud, put in earplugs. If you have noise canceling headphones, use those. Like, Do what works for you in the scenarios that you find yourself in. Rock on. Word. Yeah. As the day continues, I usually lose steam and I get a little fuzzy. And when that happens and I'm not sure what to do next, there are a few things I turn to. I consult my bullet journal and mm-hmm. that tells me what to do next. Or I get away from the computer and I look at the sky. Um, if I have time, which I don't always, but if I have time, I'll go, I'll walk down to the mailbox and back. Um, uh, this look at the sky thing is a new thing for me as an yeah. introvert who likes to be in a cave. Um, I have made a discovery recently just through happenstance and necessity that I love having my desk near, so near a window that I can cast my eyes up above my computer and look at the sky. I know not everyone has that luxury, but when I am on hour seven of Zoom conference teaching and talking and I can cast my eyes up and there's a giant hawk circling in my line of sight. I have discovered that that lifts my spirit. So that has been really helpful for me. Also, great idea. Another thing that helps me a lot is drinking a lot of water. When I drink a healthy amount of water, I feel better and I have to get up and pee more frequently, which as we know, is also very good for us to get up, to stand up, to move. I found out, I figured out I wasn't because of my bullet journaling. I figured out I just consistently wasn't drinking enough water. So now at the beginning of the day, I put a big full size 
Brita pitcher on my desk. And it is my job to drink that down by the end of the day. It is a little thing, but it helps me check that little, I drank enough water yesterday box. Mm -hmm. And like Mark Fisher said, this is not about over-functioning productivity chasing. It's more about being the kind of person that does what they say they're going to do. So I promised myself I'm going to drink a healthy amount of water every day. And I do it and, and I do, do it more it. easily now because I put the pitcher in my, on my desk instead of having it in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And another, yeah. Another thing that really helps me be my own boss, like a boss, bah, 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 yeah. is, a, is an accountability partner. Cam, <gasps> you are my accountability what? partner on the spark yes! file. Yes. Yes. You are. I'm on the um, list. You're on the list. My little friend Hunter Bell is an accountability partner on other projects. And I'll tell you, this for me has been critical. Um, We have heard repeatedly, we talk about this when we teach, but we've heard repeatedly from world-class makers like Lin-Manuel Miranda and Tommy Kale that having a good accountability partner can really bring your work to life. But an accountability partner is more than someone who likes you and wants you to succeed, though that is a part of it. An accountability partner ideally is someone who checks a lot of boxes and here they are. Someone who you hold in high regard, someone who has a clear understanding of what your goal is, someone who is as committed as you are, someone who has similar values, someone who can be available when you are available, someone genuinely interested in helping you succeed. And in addition, they must communicate in a way that is similar to you and works for you. And you must trust that they have your best interests at heart. Um, so if you don't have an accountability partner, open your heart to that possibility. Mm-hmm. A a relationship like that I have found can go a long way to getting your work done, Zoe. And for me, when I have an accountability partner, I get shit done. And I'm going to be honest with you, hashtag real talk. When I don't have an accountability partner, I don't get shit done. So So we're getting it it done. I think that you, I'm sure you covered this in your list, but as I reflect back on attempts I may have had in the past to have accountability partners or uh, collaborators, the big essential for me is, among many other things, but the big thing that rises to the top is being able to communicate what is and isn't working and not dance around it. You know, if, if Suze or I are like, uh, you know what, this 6 p.m. meeting thing, <laughs> I'm so not here. We need to meet earlier or we need to meet later we need to adjust. Yeah. And you have to be able to say that to the person and be able to receive information like that so that um, you can refine your work style. Like um, when I think it was just youth and my fear of of articulating things that might be received negatively, yeah. you know, I would uh, probably endure a lot of things and wish they would change, but wonder why they weren't changing. And that's because I wasn't articulating my needs. So Mm -hmm. you want to have a partner that you um, can say things to. Well, this this actually, this actually is something I heard recently that I think speaks to what you're talking about. And that is you want to have an accountability partner. You want to have an agreement in place with them that, of how responsive you're going to be to each other. It sort of mm. dovetails into what you're saying. So for instance, Cami and you and I actually did this quite organically, but it doesn't happen organically for all accountability partnerships. You and I respond to each other as soon as we see the piece of communication. That's right. Whether it's a text a Marco Polo, which we use a lot, or an email. We don't really call each other without texting first, but um, as soon as we see it, now there may be delay if I'm making dinner and I've left my phone on my desk, Right. but as soon as we see it, we're pretty good about responding ASAP. And that is kind of the agreement that works for us because we do a lot of time sensitive work mm-hmm. and we don't have time to like fuck around and wait. And so it's great, but I got to tell you, I don't do that with most people. I don't have that agreement with most people. And I'm sort of like, you know, you're a priority for me. So I just, uh, I just want to have said, I think it is useful to have stated clearly what your needs are in terms of if you're working with an accountability partner, how quickly you're going to get back to each Mm -hmm. other. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I feel the same way and it did happen organically, but I know, you know, if you're not responding, it is not because you're like, oh, let me kick back for three hours. I'll get to that when I get to it. <laughs> you're probably, yeah. you know, teaching or having dinner with Nathan and you will answer this as soon as you can. Yeah. Um, and even sometimes if it's a more challenging thing to, or the answer is not clear to me, I, in the formulating an answer, sometimes that will bring clarity or I can say, I, I copy that, but Need a I minute. don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's um, your five word. Copy that. Need a minute. There co- you go. Copy that. Need a minute. There you go. That's just me thinking um, through. It's, I love it. Yeah. I love how your mind is working today <laughs> in five and six word <laughs> memoir. Um, there is an African proverb that we like a lot around this topic. If you want to go fast, go alone. Mm. If you want to go far, go together. Yes. But I will tell you, if you want to go fast, go together too. Get an <laughs> accountability partner so that you don't just like be like, I'll do that next week. Or maybe, uh, you know That's what? Right. Nobody knows if I'll do it or not, so I just won't do it. So you want to go fast, <laughs> go together. I mean, you just get tired of reporting in that you haven't done anything. I think that's, that's part what of like Lynn Manuel said yes. about he's like it's it's not that Tommy Kale ever wagged his finger at Lynn if Lynn was like I didn't do the writing it's just more fun to have the writing to share it so that's that you right. can advance something that's right there's always stuff to talk about there's always things to you know tend to but it's more fun when you can report back and be like Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba, I did it I got this yeah. done you got that done. Got done we're kicking it okay yeah so. Um, my husband, Nathan, a major spark source for me mm-hmm. and a spark in and of himself. My, my, my little Nathan for the past 10 years has been his own boss, like a boss. And mm-hmm. he has been through this. is It's such a joy to have Nathan as a discussion partner because he's been living this freelance entrepreneur lifestyle longer than I have. So he's been through ups, downs. He's been through some tough seasons times when he said it would have been easy to have just laid down and not shown up. But he said he has this mantra for tough times. He he said something interesting in times like this, like during a pandemic where people would be more apt to give you some grace and give you a pass, you could hide out in that. But he said, whether that's it's a global pandemic or it's an economic downturn or just a shitty Tuesday when you get out of the bed wrong. His mantra is I'm a professional. He shows up because he's Mm. a professional and he also recommends hashtag real talk. If you work from home and you're a person who likes a cocktail that you wait until after work to have that drink because you could you could be like, I'm going to have wine with lunch. That'll be fun and naughty. And he's like, uh-uh. Uh-uh. he's like, it's a slippery slope. <laughs> Don't yeah. do it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No. Which I was like, great. I would have never thought of that. I yeah. love it. I'll take it. But it is a hazard. Um, yeah. If it is something it is. that tempts you, it's a hazard. Yeah, um, it is. You know. Yeah. Another, oh, I'll add to this again. I didn't even think to write this in, but another thing that really helps me is when I eat a lot, or I eat foods that aren't really clean. Like if I eat a lot of processed foods, I get really tired and it can kind of fuck the afternoon. So something that I've learned about myself as a freelancer is I eat light. I I, listen, I don't under eat by any stretch of the imagination, but I do try to keep it light for that work part of the day. And then I just go nuts at night when I don't have to be as sharp or as focused. Um, But for me, that can still be super satisfying. Yesterday for lunch, I had um, homemade avocado toast on bread I made, not showing off. Um, no big That's deal, but, amazing. And with two eggs over the top. So it's not uh. like, uh, it's not like I'm starving myself over here, but it's, I know that that's a meal that I can eat and still have uh, sharpness and focus. That's for right. The afternoon. That's right. Yeah. Um, another piece of be your own boss, like a boss, ba, 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 wisdom <laughs> that I learned from my little baby Cam Cams herself, Laura Camion. What? I started doing this thing because of you, Cams, and I really love it. When I have finished something, I either close the document or cross it off my bullet journal to do list, and I say out loud, "I'm finished." 
And it's also a great way to end the day. I'm finished. I finished it. I'm yes. finished. I finished it. That was um, something just to um that was something that came up when in one of our accountability groups. Um we Sue Shout um, out Sue. Sue mentioned that uh now I feel like this might be too personal to say. Be um, careful because we can't cut it. Limitations. I know. Now I feel like I shouldn't say it. I feel like it might be uh, confidentiality. There you go. Yeah. All right. Hi, we Sue. We love you, Sue Kayampa. You inspire us to say, I'm finished. How about that? So in an NPR piece by Yuki Naguchi, Yuki recommends that we try to maintain normal work hours, shut things down when you would normally leave the office. And if you're struggling from working from home, Try to appreciate the benefits that do come with remote work. Put this in your gratitude journal. You're not commuting. You're able to make your own lunch and save money by doing so. You have more control over your schedule and more time with family. Hopefully, fingers crossed, that's a good thing for you. Focus on whatever positives you can find. And speaking of focusing on the positives and focusing on what moves us, focusing on what matters to us, all of this leads me to probably the most important piece of all of this. Mm. There is a quote that Cams and I are obsessed Mm. with that we first heard from Kate Crawford. It's from a book called The Movie Goer by Walker Percy. And it goes a little something like this. You've heard us say it before. It's on the front page of our website. What is the nature of the search you ask? The search is what anyone would undertake if he were not sunk in the everydayness of his own life. To become aware of the search is to be on to something. Not to be on to something is to be in despair. I think for me, the single most important ingredient to be my own boss, like a boss, blah, 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 is having the drive to get up and get dressed up to my shoes and get my ass into workspace. It is this, I have to be on to something or at least be aware of the search. For me, when I am on to something, whether it's this podcast or creating and delivering curriculum or doing my homework for a class we're taking, that's when I really show up when I am on to something. Mm-hmm. In summary, so much. whether you have been forced to work from home by a pandemic or you want to rock the most satisfying freelance lifestyle possible, look for ways to do what works for you. Because if you can crack that code and you can customize it, make it couture for yourself, you too can be your own boss like a boss. <laughs> Quarantinas. That's it. Suze, that's my spark. That's so helpful. That is so helpful for people. I think um, everyone is trying to find their way, and it's so useful to have a, some some guide lines. Some those are and those are just tips. one girl's guide. Like yep. as you can see, based on Camions, based on Mark Fisher's, based on other people you may know, everybody responds to different things differently. Everybody. Yep is going to be set up for a good work from home day in a different yeah. way. So, and, yeah, I would add to like, and give yourself some flexibility and some forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Like what used to be my, uh, you know, journaling routine in the morning has become my journaling routine in the evening because Beautiful. I want to use my morning in a different way. And that's so, right. it, and that's all okay, you know, and, and you can use like, what is, start by asking what is working for me that I, I don't want to change. And then what yeah. do I, what isn't working? What do I want to change? Our teacher said something in class the other day that I love so much, and I may have already said it on the podcast, but enjoy it again. Uh, Be like a scientist, whether you're starting a business or trying to figure out a morning routine or how to structure your day in a meaningful way for you. Be like a scientist and get that first invention, get that first pass up and out of you, and then iterate, iterate, iterate. I loved that so much because I was just like, let's just try something and just in the natural course of of personal evolution it's going to change things yeah. are going to fall away you're going to be sparked by new things that you're like oh i'd like to try that and you're going to add those to the mix that's right but um 
But yeah, it should be what works for you. And I love the idea that whether it's the bullet journal or whether it's your morning ritual, it doesn't mean you have to learn calligraphy. It doesn't mean you have to get special tools. It doesn't mean that you have to do anything except work with the limitations and the assets <laughs> and the circumstances at hand, do your best and then iterate, iterate, iterate. Oh, I love it. I love, I love it. it. And I love you, Camion. I love Those you so were some hot, much. Hot quarantine sparks. Hot sparks. And people, can Parks. we just mention, we have a mailbag episode coming up. Tell oh. us what you're making. Tell us, yes. tell us what your morning routine is. Just talk to, tell, tell us. us, tell us what's Talk up. to us, people. I guess that's it. it we is. hope this put another it bunch is. of sparks in your file. And like Camion said, if there's a spark you'd like us to explore, if you've take to, taken a spark, fanned it into a creative flame, you want to share something with us, you want to share your morning ritual, mm -hmm. you want to share what you're making during this pandemic, email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. Calm. We will even take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you have to share a creative risk that you have taken recently. Oh, if you haven't done it already, you might want to follow us on social at The Spark File and be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe, rate, five-star review it. If you like this podcast, share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, remember your life is precious and brief. Go do something with your time <laughs> that you do love. If something tickles your fancy, gets your creative juices flowing or whatnot, we are writing you a forever permission slip to make the thing that's been knocking at your door. It is your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame. You got to fill a book with coloring. You got to memorize a speech by Dr. King. You got to make a dance or sew some pants. Just take a major swing. <gasps> and you got to take, take it, it and make and it. And make it. Sorry. Hashtag limitations. Hashtag limitations. No editing. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my spark fire. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark file. I jump into my spark file. Let's open up the spark file. Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from the Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for the Spark File Illume a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in a loom, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap take a risk, go to thesparkfile.com slash illume and join us for Illume.